This is the Blood Red Podcast from the Liverpool Echo. Hello and welcome to the latest podcast from the Blood Red channel. I'm Matt Addison and today I'm here to bring you a special episode, an interview with former Liverpool left-back Stephen Warnock, who played 67 games for the Reds between 2002 and 2007. Stephen's now a respected pundit, as I'm sure you've seen across the BBC and Sky Sports, as well as many others. And Stephen's also an ambassador for Seven Elite Academy, who are helping young people develop skills and education through football as he will explain no doubt better than I can as we started this conversation. We also spoke about Andy Robertson, who of course plays in Warnock's position, Jurgen Klopp, the new AXA training centre and plenty more. Here is that chat with Stephen as ever, a fascinating listen. Stephen, alongside me now, we're going to start talking uh, about the partnership that you've got with Seven Elite Academy and, and Coaching Connections, which I, I believe is across Liverpool and beyond helping provide a, a link between football and, and education for, for young people. So I'm sure, you know, you can describe it far better than I can. So uh, do you want to just give us a, a little bit of an idea about, you know, what the project is and, and why you're involved with it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, it was uh, Seven Elite was something I joined up with uh, last year, around about September time. Um, went to the sort of the setup in Liverpool, then found myself across in Salt Lake City, working with the youngsters on the training field and just trying to get a little bit of advice. And I was approached this year to to be an ambassador for the company, and um, they they they've linked up with Coaching Connections to give the kids an education as well, to give them that. Uh, opportunity to continue playing football but also behind the scenes to to educate them to to give them the opportunity then to go out to possibly possibly America and go to university there to try and get um, education uh, a new way of life if you like as well but it also gives the the kids in in Utah the opportunity to come across to England to study in in Liverpool and and educate themselves across this way so the connection's been really sort of brilliant for, for all parties and um, it's something that I'm very excited to be involved in. And what can people do to, to find out more about it? If they're you know interested in, in coming along and, and finding out more, is there a website or, or where where would you advise them to go? Yeah, I think, I mean, to be honest with you, I think Seven Elite's very active on, on all social media sort of platforms as everything is at them uh, these days so if you if you want to have a look on on the social media platforms coaching connections seven elite um uk seven elite just seven elite academy as well and you'll find all the information that's needed there there's plenty of links in the bios both on twitter and instagram um and then you've obviously got the, the website seven elite uk um so that's you you'll find everything you need yeah, absolutely. We'll put the, the stuff in the description as well so people can uh, access those social media accounts. I, I'd like to, to ask you a little bit about Andy Robertson as well, obviously, as a, a former left-back yourself. How different do you think the, the position is now uh, with players, not just like Robertson, but other players across Europe compared to what it was maybe you know 10 years ago or, or so? It depends. It depends who your manager is. Um, I remember being at when I was at Liverpool and Rafa Benitez basically had a handbrake on people. He just wanted you to not really cross the halfway line, didn't really want you to get forward, didn't want that um, sort of forward attacking um, fullback, if you like. But then when I went to, to Blackburn and joined Mark Hughes at Blackburn, the the sort of narrative straight away was, you're overlapping Morton Gams Pedersen every single time he gets the ball. You've got to make an option. You've got to get forward. Um it was the same when I then joined Aston Villa. I was a very attack-minded fullback, so I don't think the game's evolved too much in that way. I think what does help the fullback these days is the different formation, as in the four-three-three. Midfielders are narrow. You've always got a higher, wider player who's possibly pushing his fullback a little bit more. Um, so your runs forward are actually easier to make because of the midfield three not quite being able to get out to that side and. Uh, you don't necessarily have a, a wide right midfielder of a four who's constantly staying with you. So I think it just it's it's freed up a little more, little bit more space for fullbacks, and that's how managers have counteracted the four three three system. In terms of Andy Robertson, where do you think he ranks among the the best in that position at at this, at this moment in time? There's obviously other players around Europe who are performing at a, a high level, but do you think he is sort of up there with the the top two or three? I think there's him and Alfonso Davis. I think they're the they're the two standout left backs in in world football at the moment. I think Alfonso Davis is 
uh, burst onto the scene. I think he's been phenomenal. Andy Robertson has, has proved it over a number of years or a few years now, especially since he's, he's stepped into the Liverpool team. What I love about Andy Robertson is there's, there's never questions asked about him defensively. Um, we know the qualities he has going forward, but we often look at defensive capabilities of a defender, of a fullback, and can they do that? I think, like you say now, is how is that perceived? How is a fullback looked at? I think they're looked at in a different way. It's almost like how many assists can they make? It's they're not sort of uh, they're not sort of talked about as how well they've defended and how well they uh, how many clean sheets they 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 can keep as well. But I think when you look at Andy Robertson, for me, he's he's become an all round left back, brilliant defensively, brilliant going forward. Um, him and Alfonso Davis, I wouldn't be bothered which one I had in my team. I'd be delighted with either of them, and I think that that's giving them as much praise as you can give them because when you're putting them two players in the same bracket, I think that tells you how well they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Probably the the two best teams in the world at the moment, the two best left-backs as well. Yeah. I mean, Liverpool long-term will hope that, that Kostas Simikas, who came in over the summer, can provide genuine competition for Andy Robertson. How much does it help the, the number one in a position if they've got someone behind them that they know has a genuine chance of coming into the team? Yeah, I think that's the big thing is is that it'll help Andy Robertson because it'll push him because he'll know that his, his form can't drop. Um, he'll also give it gives him an opportunity to have rest as well um, and rotation when he when he's fit, Simicus, and when he's up to speed of how Liverpool like to play. I watched him against Lincoln. I was actually at the Lincoln game and I thought he did it. He did really well on the night, Simicus, and he he almost fitted into the mould of Liverpool's team straight away, and you could see the quality of his crossing that he brings in. But he's got to believe, and I do believe he believes that he can push Robertson because I saw his interview. A lot of people can sort of say, well, I'm, I'm coming here to, to push the players. But I actually genuine, genuinely believe his sort of last 18 months, his confidence has grown hugely um, at Olympiacos. And he's coming into Liverpool, excited to obviously be at the club, but genuinely believing I'm going to improve under Jurgen Klopp and, the, and, and his staff. And where that can take me, I'm excited to see. So he's got to fully believe that he can push Robertson. And Robertson's got to also believe that someone's breathing down his neck. Andy Robertson, the only one of Liverpool's first choice back for fitter at this moment in time. And even he missed one of the games for Scotland during the international break. It looks like Fabinho will be back for the weekend, potentially. He's been seen in training this week. But just with this injury crisis that Liverpool have got, how much do you think that will impact their season? this season yeah, it's bound to impact it um, it doesn't make them as strong um, but you you look at the quality around Liverpool squad and you think obviously Trent stepping out the team at the moment for uh, maybe four to six weeks possibly well you look at the replacement you think straight away you've got James Milner to play in that right back position you've got Nico Williams who can also play there obviously the the troublesome position is centre half if Fabinho's fit is he how fit is he um, Joel Matip again um, you're looking at him playing in that position and sort of his injury record is a concern I think that's something that all Liverpool fans are wary of is that um, he doesn't play a consistent run of games for long enough so it's bound to impact the team it's bound to have some sort of knock-on effect but what I will say is is that the mentality of this team and how they've answered the critics so far since Van Dijk stepped out the team and everyone said, well, that's Liverpool's title challenge gone. They've been exceptional since he stepped up the team. Do you think they have to, to dip into the January transfer window? Or do you think that Liverpool could, if they needed to, get by until next summer when maybe the right option might pop up for them in that position? I think it all depends on the length of Joe Gomez's injury. I think, for me, it looks like possibly, was it three to four months? I think... If he hadn't got injured, I don't think they'd have gone into the transfer market. I think now it's almost forced the hand to do that because I think they thought, OK, we've got Gomez, Matip and, and Fabinho to play in those centre-half positions. Obviously, Nat Phillips has done extremely well when he's played as well. In, well, in the one game that he played against West Ham, he was, he was outstanding. Rhys Williams now picking up an injury as well. How long does he step out the team for? Um, we're hoping that, that that's not too uh, of a... Of of a main concern and and he won't be out for too long but I just think when and you're looking at Gomez's injury you're almost playing you're playing with fire um, to have just two 
experienced players in that position. I think you need to add another body into there. The one thing we do know about Liverpool and, and Jurgen Klopp and Michael Edwards and his staff is that they'll only buy the player if, if he's the right fit. But we have seen in the past that Jurgen Klopp and Michael Edwards have also bought in for the short term. Now, you think back of Clavan, he was literally bought in to, to be a stopgap for a year, two years. The amount of football that he played was it was very minimal. But it was just when called upon, is he reliable? Will he do a job for that one or two games that he has to step in for? And that's the difference at Liverpool is that when you're a top team, and when I say a top team, I mean in like the elite team, is that you've got to have players who can step in for, for, for 20, 30 games and perform at a high level. But when you've got a stopgap, Often players can perform for one, two, three games at an elite level, but then they have a huge drop off. They can't keep that consistency. And that's why they don't play at the elite level. And that's what you're almost looking for is that, okay, Matip and Fabinho are going to be your one and two. But can that someone step in if Matip or Fabinho picks up a two, three week injury or gets a suspension to play at that level? And that's the, that's the, the challenge that they have in the transfer market in, in uh, January. Jordan Henderson as well picked up a, a little bit of an injury uh, for England. We hope that, that that's obviously not too bad. And I've got to ask you about him as well, because I think you played uh, against him when he made his debut for Sunderland. You were playing for, for Aston Villa at the time. And at the I was time, of for course, Blackburn, yeah. For Blackburn, was, was it? For Blackburn, Apologies. yeah. No, yeah. No, that's okay. Um, I believe he was playing in a, a sort of right-sided midfield role. That's where he came through at, at, at Sunderland in a, a sort of 4-4-2. Do you think... The fact that he played in that position and, and later has transitioned into a, a central midfielder, do you think that would have helped him at all? Yeah, it'll always help you because you, um, you, you, your awareness on the pitch of certain positions, your tactical understanding of, of pushing outside. But when we look at Jordan Henderson and how he's evolved of late, Liverpool tried to play him or Jurgen Klopp tried to play him in that deep lying role and he always felt he was better at driving forward and that comes from his, his youth experience and playing in that wide area. He almost finds himself out in that wide area an awful lot. He likes to drift out onto that right-hand side, but higher up. And um, I think that obviously comes from his, his his days of playing as a right midfielder when he when he was playing for Sunderland. And when he first joined uh, Liverpool, he played in that wide, wide, wide right position as well. So um, it's not a surprise that he feels more comfortable in that right of a three because it almost is that sort of that wide of a four just tucking in ever so slightly. And in terms of, obviously, the weight lifted off Liverpool's shoulders, off Jordan Henderson's shoulders as well to, to lift that Premier League title, I mean, how much do you think it was a, a big achievement for, for Henderson, not just as, as the captain, but as, a, as an individual as well, to, to be the one who helped Liverpool end that title drought? That must have been a, a huge thing for him. Yeah, you, could, you could see it in his face. I mean, to lift the European Cup the season before and then to to go on and lift the title after a 30-year wait when you've had, um, obviously, Ger Stephen Gerrard tried his best to, to be that man to step forward, a local man. He's obviously gone into the, the footsteps of Gerrard and many people have said he's he wasn't capable of filling the boots. He was never going to fill the boots of Gerrard, never going to be able to be that type of player. But what he is, he's, he's a different type of leader. Um, he's very vocal on the pitch. I think we're all hearing him at the moment. Um, there's plenty of videos circulating on YouTube, uh, sorry, on social media where we're hearing Henderson talking people through the game, encouraging them, giving them tellings off when they need it, uh, dragging them into positions. He is he is a fantastic leader. You can see it on the pitch. Having been an ex-professional, you can tell the qualities of a captain when you see them on the pitch and what they bring and, and how they try and uh, sort of influence players in and around them and not being afraid to have that voice. I think he's been unbelievable and how he's sort of brushed off criticism, um, not only from outside influences, but also within Liverpool fans. He had a tough time with Liverpool fans and he's, he's fought through that. And I think that's why he's gained even more respect from the Liverpool fans as well. Uh, phenomenal tal uh, phenomenal player, but a uh, phenomenal captain as well. And I think you, you only you see that from the, the players in and around him, how much respect that they have for him. And that's, that speaks volumes for him.
And you mentioned those videos that we've seen on, on Twitter and, and various places of him talking other players through the game. Is that a rare thing for, for a professional to do? Or is that a difficult thing for, for people to do? Because presumably Jordan Henderson is, is not the only one, but it, it, it isn't necessarily something that everyone can do and, and have the, the confidence, as you say, to be able to, to do that on a football pitch. No, it, it is confidence. It's confidence to be able to concentrate not only on your game, but also being aware of what people need on the pitch and whether that's just a little pat on the back or whether it's a little bit of encouragement, it's a well done, or whether it is turning around saying you need to be better. That's judging characters on the pitch and knowing the, the character of that person and knowing what to say at the right time and when to say it. That's a skill within itself. And again, that's why he is captain material and that's why he is the captain of Liverpool Football Club but it takes a lot to to almost take away from your own game to be able to bring everyone else's games in and around you to sacrifice your own and I don't I'm not saying that he sacrifices his own but you just wonder if he concentrated solely on his game what level he could actually go to but I don't think I think he's he's managed to find this incredible blend of making sure everyone else around him knows what he expects of them, but keeping his levels extremely high as well. Yeah, an absolutely huge part of this Liverpool team under Jurgen Klopp. I'm sure you get asked this a lot, Stephen, but how much would you have liked to, to have played under Jurgen Klopp? I, I mean, I, I say it all the time, whenever anyone asks me this question, I say, tell me a Liverpool ex-Liverpool player who wouldn't have. I don't think you'd find one who didn't want to play for him. This guy's just... Phenomenal. Um, it's the type of football that, live, as fans, you want to watch. As players, you're desperate to play in it because you see, you see how exciting it is, how hard to play against it is, how they smother teams, how they suffocate teams. That feeling that you must get. Um, and what it does is it creates this buzz in and around the ground and it creates a fear when you go to away grounds. And to have that aura about you as a team, to step out and play in that team must be phenomenal. Um, I'd have loved to have played for, for Jurgen Klopp. And I, I don't think, again, I don't think many wouldn't have. Um, and you, you just wonder what it would have, what would be like. I mean, I've, I've been fortunate to be in a, um, in a changing room with him before a game, which was uh, the James Milner charity do, um, the charity game up at Celtic Park against Silly and Petros team. And he gave like a... Um, sort of a, a brief little team talk and you got a sort of an insight into the type of character he is, character he is and type of person he is. And he is, he's so infectious. He's just that guy that you want to play for. And um, listen, Liverpool are, are more than lucky to have him. Um, and he, But it's just, it's a perfect match, isn't it? They work so well together because of the way that the club have backed him, the way that the fans adore him. I think he, he feels very happy living in the city and he obviously loves loves the club as well. I'm sure there were lots of great qualities that each of the managers that you played under had, but does he sort of bring together the, the best of, of each of them, if that makes sense? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I love his passion on the sideline. It, it, you're looking across and he, he's kicking every ball and, and that's very easy to say about a lot of managers, but... I honestly feel that he's so in, involved in the game and the way that he approaches it. Um, he never lets players drop the standards. If he, if you do, you know about it, no matter what the result is. I think the, the, the biggest sort of show of that was um, against Atta, Atalanta away uh, with a 5 nil up and he's still proclaiming that Liverpool should have had a penalty and, and protesting with the, the fourth official and gets himself booked. And But that shows how much... It means to him. Um, listen, I'm sure there's very tough times at, at times behind the scenes where long hours and the, the stress of the of the of the game and making sure things are right, especially in in these very difficult moments. But he's just tactically superb. I think the biggest the biggest thing for me is is that I remember when he first came in and he said heavy metal, heavy metal, heavy metal. And it, it was just, a, it was almost like Kevin Keegan at Newcastle will score more goals than you. But now it's got to the point where he's adapted his management skill and he's he's learned that, OK, we can't do that within the Premier League. It's much stronger than the Bundesliga. There's tougher teams. The golf's not as big from top to bottom. And um, he's adapted his, his tactics and he's just got better and better year on, year out since he's been at, at Liverpool. And it's it's great to see. 
He's been a, a big driver, of course, towards the, the new AXA training centre that Liverpool have, have moved into this week. I just wanted to, to ask you, really, as a, an academy player, as somebody who's at Liverpool now, how much of a difference would that make to, to that group of players, knowing now that the first team is literally just next door? It, it's a sort of genuine, you know, actual tangible path from, from the academy to the first team. How much of a difference will that make? It'll make a huge difference. I mean, if I put myself back in that position and... Uh, I'm looking down the down the end of the path of you coming out of the academy and you can see that first team building. That's the goal every day. That's the goal to achieve. It's will Jurgen Klopp come and watch our training session today? Will any of the first team staff be coming out to see us? Will any of the first team players just have a wander down and perhaps chat to any of us? Will he find themselves in the building having a bite to eat? Will the phone go to say, listen, we need four academy players up at the uh, first team today. We want to have a look at them. Will that be me? And I just think that difference of being right on the doorstep of the first team is great, not only for the academy players, but for Jurgen Klopp as well. Because to drive from Melwood to Kirby and back to Melwood, whatever it might be, um, that's a couple of hours out of his day, which he's probably thinking, I need that time to be preparing for certain things. Now he jumps on probably a, a golf trolley or whatever it might be drives himself down to the training pitches, has a quick discussion with the with the staff, little monitor over the, the training session, picks the players up in the academy, gives them a huge lift to see the manager there, gives the staff a huge lift, and he might just see something on the pitch and go, I like him, I like the look of him, or who have you got your eye on here, who are we looking at, what are we looking to do? And he just drops a little bit, a few snippets into the coaches of the academy staff, and suddenly... You've got new ideas within the uh, within the training setup, so I think it's huge. I think it's it's hugely positive for uh, for not only the, the the academy but the first team as well. Yeah, an absolutely massive move, Stephen. Thank you so much for for speaking to us. It's been an absolute pleasure. No problems. Thanks for having me on.